Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs Daily War Room Update. We are on day 107 of the war with the terrorists in Gaza, day 106 with the terrorists in Lebanon, and day 105 with the terrorists in Yemen. Um, just to give the, a general overview of what's been going on over the last 48, 72 hours, um, the Israeli forces are continuing to operate in the Gaza Strip, really trying to consolidate their stronghold on the northern Gaza Strip and then expanding operations also into the southern Gaza Strip. Over the last uh, 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, really since Thursday, since our last broadcast, the IDF forces have uncovered uh, a massive uh, a factory for making rockets, tens of uh, um, kilograms of, uh, of, of, of both the weaponry needed to make the rockets and the explosives needed to arm them. Um, they've also uncovered tunnels which joined between the northern area of the Gaza Strip and the southern area of the Gaza Strip, and in some cases a tunnel which was 20 meters underground underneath the town of Hanunis, one of those big Palestinian towns in the southern area of the Gaza Strip, um, where many of the hostages taken on the October 7 as part of the massacre, they not only massacred 1,200 people, but they also took 240 um, hostages, some of whom have been released, 139 of them still remain in Gaza. Um, the terrorists themselves this morning have just continued on with their mortar fire over the area of the southern envelope of the Gaza Strip into Kusufim, into Sufa, um, and that area which is just adjacent again to the southern Gaza Strip. But that's really the major developments in that area. In the north, we've seen a continuation of the fighting with Hezbollah, even intensifying um, with Israel striking uh, um, just today, this afternoon, two Hezbollah terrorists who were driving along uh, and they were struck by rockets fired allegedly by an Israeli UAV. Um, and we don't know exactly who they are yet, but it would appear that they are definitely Hezbollah terrorists. Their identities remain, as I said, uh, um, not quite clear at the moment. But that war going on with Hezbollah is a war to all intents and purposes. Um, there are Hezbollah, on the one hand, firing anti tank rockets into Israel, mortar shells into Israel, um, rockets into Israel. The destruction on Israel's northern border is quite extensive. But in the meantime, Israel responding um, only my, uh, 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 really minorly against these aggression against this aggression um attacking predominantly the hezbollah forces on the border and sometimes a little bit further but not very often we're talking about 163 hezbollah terrorists who have been killed since the start of the war with yemen uh, um, down to our south they continue their aggression and uh, impeding the freedom of navigation again attacking a ship on thursday um, a, this time a Greek ship traveling up via Bab el Manda into the Red Sea and uh, trying to get through the Suez Canal. Um, in Jordan and Samaria, we've seen a continuation of the attempts to carry out terror attacks. On the one hand, let's just remind ourselves that Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine, um, the Al-Aqsa Martyr Brigades, all of those terrorist organizations who participated in the October 7 massacre, together with others, have not only branches in Gaza, but also are also the same organizations in Judea and Samaria. Mm -hmm. And they continue all the time with their attempts to carry out substantial terror attacks um, also in the heart of Israel and in Judea and Samaria itself. In Israel, the calm has remained. Um, we saw the Friday prayers at the Al-Aqsa Mosque going off without any type of incident. This is one of the really, as we know, the, the Hamas terrorist organization called its October 7 massacre the Al-Aqsa flood, flood, trying to in some way connect their barbarism, the raping, butchering of innocents to defending the Al-Aqsa mosque. And really, as we see, um, we are 170, 107 days into the war and nothing has happened on the Al-Aqsa mosque for anyone who says Al-Aqsa Mosque is in danger, you should know that this is just one of the battle cries 
of the Palestinians, the Palestinian Authority, Hamas, as a means to garner support in the Arab world, as if Israel intends to, in some way, um, harm or destroy even um, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. It's simply not true, but that's the propaganda that's being uh, um, used. And on that note now, we will, uh, um, let me allow to introduce my, uh, our uh, special guest today, um, Dr. Ephraim Karsh. For those, uh, um, uh, for those who don't know uh, um, the name and don't know how to uh, exact, automatically uh, associate amazing works, um, Dr. Karsh is an Emeritus Professor of Middle East uh, and Mediterranean Studies at King's College in London. He's written extensively, extensively on everything to do with uh, um, uh, uh, the Middle East in general, specifically with the Israel, uh, um, Israeli Arab conflict as a, as a general subject, and specifically on the Palestinian subject. Um, just a few days ago, um, after we released a study asking why the world really hates the Gazans so much, and pointing to the fact that Israel had done more to support the Gaza Strip than any of its other uh, um, uh, um, other conquerors at any stage. Um, someone wrote to me immediately, Dr. Daniel Pipes wrote to me immediately and it said, Maurice, you missed out quoting extensive study written by, by Dr. Karsh already in 2002. Um, for those of you who are interested, um, the, the article is entitled What Occupation? Written already in 2002. Gives amazing, amazing, amazing information as to how much Israel has contributed literally to the Gaza Strip and uh, uh, um, and is now being attacked by those same people who were the recipients of so much of Israel's goodwill. Um, and, and so what we're going to discuss today really is, is the wider picture. Almost the understanding that the war that started on the 7th of October didn't happen uh, um, as something which was sporadic. It was something which was planned uh, meticulously by the terrorists. It was something that was orchestrated by the Iranian regime. It was something that was activated in order to undermine, if you remember, through August, September, there were extensive talks, public talks going on about uh, um, really uh, uh, broadening the Abraham Accords and including now Saudi Arabia as well into those uh, accords and really creating a, a, a banner of peace from, from the Arabian Sea all the way um, to the Atlantic. And that's something which the Iranians were were, were heavily invested in undermining. Um, and the best way to do it, they see, is for the terrorists in Gaza to kill Jews. The Jews will respond. And then the Arab world will obviously be horrified by the sight of uh, of dead Palestinians as a means to undermine all of that process. So, uh, Dr. Kosh, thank you for joining us. Um, you should know that you have a, a, a many fans here at the JCPA, um, and I'm sure around the world. Um, Give us a little bit of a background on the Abraham Accords, how we got there, and and really how uh, uh, how Iran sought to use and abuse the Abraham Accords or the possibility of extending them in by by initiating uh, this Gaza war. Yeah, no, thank you very much. A pleasure to be uh, with you. Uh, if you let me, I'll go even much further than the Abraham Accord, and I'll start from the point that you mentioned at the end of your uh, presentation, which was Al-Aqsa, the threat, the supposed threat to Al-Aqsa. So the person who basically invented this uh, catchphrase uh, was the leader of the Palestinians uh, between the 1920s and the 1940s, Haj Amin al-Husseini was the Mufti of Jerusalem, and he started talking about this kind of threat to Al-Aqsa in the late 20s, and of course it led to the massacres of uh, 1929, where about 170 Jews were killed. And if you take the proportion in relation to the population at the time, it wasn't smaller than the October 7th uh, massacre, and no less uh, brutal and barbarous, especially the extermination of the biblical Jewish uh, community in Hebron. And uh, this was one of the slogans that uh, the Palestinian Arab leadership used in order to implicate the Arabs uh, in the Arab-Israeli conflict from the start. Now, Arab politics uh, during the 20th century, and to a certain extent even a bit uh, afterwards, was dominated by the notion of Pan-Arabism, that there is supposedly 
an Arab nation that uh, all Arabs are belong to the same nation and they should eventually unite and create uh, one uh, universal empire. So in fact, this was uh, the lowest common denominator around which they could uh, unite was anti-Zionism. And this is what uh, happened over the last uh, 100, 100 years or so. But in fact, uh, behind this facade of uh, Arab unity was the ulterior motive and distinct interest of the various Arab leaders. Each of them uh, promoted its own agenda and none of them really cared about the Palestinians. So there were the Hashemites, uh, which were the rulers of uh, what is today Jordan and Iraq, even though they were then, of course, uh, destroyed in Iraq in 1958. And they had their own dealings with the, Palestinians, with the Israelis. Then they had other Arab leaders who dealt with the Israelis and so on and so forth. But at the same time, they created anti-Zionism as the rallying call uh, for the Arab masses. In fact, the Arabs never cared about the Palestinians and uh, none of their intervention over the 100 years was uh, on behalf of the Palestinians, even if you take the 48 wars. They didn't come, they didn't invade Israel at the time in order to, to save the Palestinians. Had Israel been destroyed, its territory uh, would have been uh, dismembered. Uh, partitioned and divided among the Arab forces. And you have endless evidence of this. The Syrians would have taken the, the Galili, even the Lebanese would have taken something. Egypt would have taken the, the Negev and Jordan would have taken the central part of Israel. So the Palestinian nation would have never existed. So in a way, paradoxically, they have to thank Israel for the Nakba because had Israel been destroyed in 48, there wouldn't be a Palestinian question at all. And the same applied uh, later. So in contrast to the common assumption among many Westerners, academics, politicians, especially the Obama administration and now the Biden administration, that the Palestine, the question of Palestine is the, the key to wider uh, regional stability, peace, tranquility. The opposite is the case. Uh, in order to achieve Israeli-Palestinian peace, you have to achieve first Arab-Palestinian peace. I thought uh, in the same uh, way, in fact, quite for quite some time, and at a certain point, I think uh, Benjamin Netanyahu came to adopt, I cannot, I didn't study really when he started believing it this way, but at a certain point he adopted this approach that rather than seek an agreement with the Palestinian, you will seek an agreement with the Arab states, and once you have an Israeli-Arab alliance or reconciliation, then they'll put pressure on the Palestinians, or alternatively the Palestinians will realize that they don't take the automatic support of the Arabs behind them, and they'll make peace. I think this is the right way to move forward, and this is indeed what happened and led to the Abraham Accords. Now, obviously, the Palestinians are very unhappy about this. The American administration was not uh, very happy either. I mean, the Trump administration helped promote it, in fact. But then, of course, came the Biden administration. And I think the Netanyahu government, uh, and Israel more generally, lost support for this direction. And the Palestinians realized it, and the Iranians realized it, and their allies in the Middle East. And I think at certain point they uh, be, began thinking about ways to undermine this development, which is of course uh, to their detriment. Of course, part of it at a certain point, which is why Netanyahu became so successful in this, was the Iranian threat. The Arab states of the Gulf uh, realized that Israel is not the real enemy and that Israel is a strong, powerful uh, nation that can help them contain Iran's uh, imperial ambitions in the Gulf. In fact, they began realizing it already in the Iran-Iraq war 30 years ago, but the process uh, gained momentum the closer Tehran came to obtaining uh, nuclear weapons, especially the, the Obama administration seemed to be helping it uh, by signing the 2015 uh, agreement. So then 
they began planning, I don't have uh, obviously inside information about when and how, and eventually it culminated when it culminated in uh, October uh, 2023. The question is why particularly this moment, we, we really don't know. There is no doubt that part of it, the reason is what happened in Israel over the past year, the, the domestic uh, squabbles over the, the legal reform and the, the, the widespread uh, civil disobedience or even more, especially within the IDF, uh, all these refuse needs. And there is no doubt that they reinforced uh, the opinion of the Hezbollah and, and of Hamas that uh, the time is coming that they can strike at Israel uh, and uh, catch it uh, unprepared. Uh, there is plenty of evidence about this. Uh, there's, I'm sure you are aware of it as well, a lot of speeches over the past year by Hamas and Hezbollah leaders about this disintegrating Israeli system, the, the weakening Israel system. Aruri, for example, the one that was uh, killed a couple of a few weeks ago, uh, was talking that this was the, the right time to attack Israel. And then came uh, the attack that, of course, uh, one of the immediate goals was to undermine the, the Abraham Accords. But in the final account, uh, what lies at the bottom is the overall uh, rejection of Jewish statehood and uh, their unwilling to accept Israel on any part of Palestine. So, so here, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Kirsch. The, the question really is, what would have happened had we actually managed to get to that point where, where Saudi Arabia is brought into the fold of the Abraham Accords, and we really do create that really very wide axis against Iran? Is that something which Iran would have allowed, would have tolerated? Where do you see that connection going? Nothing's really changed. Iran is the same Iran still trying to develop its nuclear weapons if it hasn't already. And that threat is posed not only to Israel, but also to Saudi Arabia. So, so where is Saudi Arabia in that whole uh, uh, um, idea? Do they have still the understanding that Israel is a, a potential, uh, not even ally, but not necessarily an enemy? and that Iran and, and Tehran remain the enemy. I, I, I don't have any doubt about this, but of course today the situation is far more complicated. Saudi Arabia cannot continue as if nothing has happened because, as I said, the Palestinian question has become the lowest common denominator that inciting the Arab masses and taking them into the streets. Even though, interestingly enough, it seems to me you see far less uh, demonstrations in the Arab world against Israel than you see in European capitals. You have uh, in London a much larger and more uh, virulent uh, demonstrations against Israel than in Cairo, for example. So yeah, Saudi Arabia, I think all the, the Abraham Accord states and other states like uh, Jordan, for example, they secretly wanting Israel to defeat and destroy Hamas. There is no doubt about this. And uh, of course, you, you see reports about uh, covered messages to Israel in this vein, but I don't know, but I know that this is the way they think. They cannot say it publicly, which is why it is so important that Israel will do what basically these Arab states wanted to do and uh, complete the mission that it took upon itself to destroy Hamas. Because if it doesn't do this, of course, it undermines uh, one of the main foundations upon which the, the Arab, uh, the nascent Arab uh, Israeli alliance was crystallizing, which is Israel as a regional superpower. If it cannot defeat Hamas really and is deterred vis a vis Hezbollah, then why do we need it uh, vis a vis Iran, which is much more powerful? And in this respect, uh, I'm afraid, of course, the Biden administration is not really uh, providing uh, the right uh, support and uh, backing. Of course, it helped Israel a lot uh, by deploying uh, the naval units at the beginning of the conflict and has been supporting Israel uh, militarily very staunchly. And the President Biden has had a very impressive pro-Israel statement. Uh, the, 
at the beginning of the war, but you see that the administration is such, I mean, the, the, the Department of State, uh, Secretary Blinken and some others are pushing in another direction. Blinken said that uh, having a Palestinian state will isolate Iran and, and, and promote regional stability. And of course, the opposite is, is the truth. I mean, uh, the Palestinian state, which is very likely to be dominated by Hamas in any case, because the Palestinian so. Palestinian Authority or the PLO to which basically of which it is an extension is much weaker than Hamas uh, overall and even in the West Bank. We saw the Palestinian polls showing overwhelming support for the atrocities and for Hamas and uh, the PLO is in any case uh, on the way down. There is a good reason that uh, Mahmoud Abbas hasn't held elections uh, for nearly 20 years. I mean, his uh, presidency basically expired in 2009. Why didn't he have election? Because he knew that he was going to lose. So if you have a Palestinian state in the West Bank, it will very likely be a Hamas state. And even if it is a PLO state, of course, it's not the state of the nature that uh, Secretary Blinken envisages. So in this respect, I think Israel should defeat Hamas and then continue the building of the alliance with the moderate, as we call them, uh, Arab states. And if this uh, moves further, then sooner or later the Palestinians will realize that they are alone and they don't have any chance of defeating Israel. And sooner or later they'll come to the conclusion that they have to accept Israel as it is. To what extent do you think that, that, that Saudi Arabia uh... I mean, when ISIS, when Daesh started, we didn't see broad support from the from the Arab countries for Daesh, for, Daesh, for those terrorists, for ISIS. And and here we are, we have the the Palestinian equivalent. This organization that beheads people, that burns people, that rapes women, that that, that takes hostages. And so, why is it so difficult for Saudi Arabia to say openly, clearly, that this Hamas needs to be uh, um, destroyed? Wouldn't you think that that would be also in their interest as providing really a clear moral compass against that type of, of, of violence and terrorism? Yeah, but it's a tactical measure. I mean, people, especially in the West, they don't realize that the Middle East, I mean, is, is a very devout area in the way that the West has, has ceased to be hundreds of years ago. I mean, Islam... I mean, I wrote an entire book of it, so I can, it's now called Islamic imperialism, and uh, following uh, the notion from uh, Muhammad to this very day. So in Islam, there is no separation, as you know, between uh, state and church. And in this respect, uh, this, uh, the linking of the two has never happened. And uh, Islam as a religion and social force is very deeply embedded in the Middle East. So the fact is that uh, large parts, most parts of, of, of societies in the Middle East are, are uh, devout. And uh, you could say that basically belong to the milieu of the Muslim Brotherhood and other organizations. And the fact that these are not in power is because uh, the regimes in the Middle East are hardly democratic. Uh, they, they suppress them uh, very brutally. In fact, when there is semi-democratic election in Egypt, it's again power after the overthrow of uh, Mubarak. And we had this so-called uh, Arab Spring, uh, which was never really a spring uh, from the outset. But again, the Americans were pushing it because they naively assumed that it would lead uh, to democracy. Though the Middle East is a very devout area. Islamic forces are very strong, and you cannot really go against them. I mean, even Saudi Arabia is, is a devout uh, country. You cannot do many things there that, uh, I mean, you'll be punished, for example, if you drink alcohol in public and so on and so forth. So they cannot go against them uh, in a very st strong way. But at the same time, they know that their version of Islam is antithetical to Saudi uh, existence. I mean, already Khomeini, when you read his statements upon coming to power and he spoke, the Islamic revolution is not Iran's only should spread across the world and the entire world should become a Muslim. And he spoke against, uh, he said that monarchy and hereditary monarchy especially is antithetical to Islam. And he tried to undermine the Gulf monarchies. 
So the Saudis know that, you know, the moment the Iranians can do it, they overthrow them very quickly. And therefore they need some strong backing for a long time. America was this power, but uh, over the last uh, few decades, America got increasingly disengaged from uh, the Middle East, especially it gained momentum under the Obama administration. And then the South is looking for alternatives. So it explained to a certain extent their flirtations with the Chinese, and it explained their uh, flirtation with Israel. But as I said before, it all depends now, you know, apart from the existential question for Israel of defeating Hamas, uh, this uh, issue is critical for Israel's regional standing. Without this, the entire uh, Abraham Accords and their offshoots will collapse. So, unfortunately, that, 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 that brings me to a, 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 a much more difficult question, I think. Given the fact that the populations are, um, I think, inherently religious, and given, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that the idea of Islam and the existence of a Jewish country um, in Israel doesn't really go together. To mm. what extent is it really possible to make peace with our Arab neighbors as a differentiating peace as being, uh, we have peace between leaderships. We have a non-aggression uh, 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 pact maybe, but not really. we're not really seeing tremendous peace. After the Abraham Accords, we saw a, a spike in, in, uh, uh, um, in trade between Israel and the Abraham Accord countries. But we're not really seeing that, 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 that rapprochement between the peoples themselves. Um, it's very, very clear in Egypt and in Jordan, where, where despite having peace uh, agreements for, for almost 50 years and, and, and 30 years, uh, uh, respectively, the, the, the populations are still heavily anti-Semitic and anti-Israel. Is there any difference between them and the Saudi and the Saudi population? Is a, a chance of peace between the populations really even an option? I think uh, with the UAE, uh, you see that there is uh, more encouraging signs, as far as I can understand. I haven't been there, but as far as I understand from people, Israelis have been there uh, by the thousands. Uh, the UAE uh, people's approach is different, but uh, I agree with you. I mean, this is why the Arab-Israeli conflict uh, has continued for so long. It has nothing to do with 67. It has nothing to do with uh, occupation, so-called. It has nothing to do with the so-called settlements. It has to do with two issues. You have the rejection of the idea of Jewish statehood on the grounds of either pan-Arabism, because you have one Arab nation, the so-called Palestine is a small uh, province of it, and therefore it shouldn't be controlled by the Jews. And, of course, pan-Islam, that this is, and you see it in Hamas's charter, for example, this is an Islamic endowment, uh, Palestine. It's part of the Muslim war, and therefore the Jews uh, shouldn't uh, control it. But what happened in, in, in real life, if you go back even to Jabotinsky's uh, Iron Wall, the Jews have managed to build some kind of Iron Wall and to prove to their neighbors that they cannot uh, destroy them. And therefore, little by little, they've come to acquiesce in the existence, not the legitimacy, but existence of a Jewish state. And this led Sadat to break ranks with the Arabs and make peace and so on. We can only speculate how Egypt would have been had Sadat not been uh, murdered. Because to me, Sadat seemed more uh, genuine than his predecessor, but Mubarak definitely viewed peace very instrumentally, basically as a means to improve his position in the Arab world and to improve his relations with the United States. As a result of the peace, Egypt became the number one recipient of American uh, civilian aid, uh, more than Israel, much more. So, yes, uh, I don't. I don't think that in this respect uh, they'll encourage uh, the grassroots support uh, to, to develop. Unless again, you have a very courageous uh, leaders like Sadat uh, who go beyond the formal peace. I can tell you a very revealing story uh, about Jordan, for example. I mean, the, the Israeli, the Jews had a 
interaction with the Hashemites since the 1920s. I mean, in 1919, Weizmann signed an agreement with Faisal, who became later the king of Iraq, uh, who supported the Balfour Declaration and its implementation. And Israel has saved Jordan in many ways. I mean, they saved King Hussein in 1970, when Syria invaded and so on and so forth. Now in uh, two or three, uh, 21 years ago, I was visiting professor at Harvard and in my class uh, I, about the Arab-Israeli conflict and those were the times of the Arafat's war of terror, which has been wrongly called the second intifada. It was never an intifada, which is popular uprising. It was a deliberate war of terror. And I had one student who was very problematic and he came with the most absurd, you know, conspiracy theories about Israel and Hamas. And he said that Israel wants Hamas uh, to become stronger because uh, it wants to perpetuate its control of the territories, blah, blah, blah. And I put him in his place. Then a few days later, he came to my office and he said, look, uh, Professor Karps, uh, I apologize for, for my behavior in class. I'm a Jordanian. And uh, we know the Palestinians, so ignore what I said. We know the true nature and we don't like them any more than you do. So, okay, I was, then I went to the office to check uh, who he was, a Jordanian student and this. Turned out that he was the son of Queen Noor, which at the time uh, was a potential uh, heir to the throne That's and right. uh, a half brother of uh, the King Abdallah. At a certain point, Abdallah put him under arrest. He said that he conspired against him and so on. So you see, this basically, I think, epitomizes the, 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 the approach of the Hashemites and other Arab states. They benefit from Israel a lot, but in public, they pretend uh, <laughs> to be uh, tough on Israel. Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, if the Israeli approach of, of acquiescing is this, is the right one, maybe Israel has... I have some colleagues who think that Israel should have shown a, you know, tougher approach, especially vis-a-vis -vis the Hashemites, uh, Jordan, who are much more dependent on us than they are, uh, we are dependent on them. But Israel, you know, as a Jewish state, is normally wiping uh, the spitting and pretending that it was rain. We, 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 we unfortunately tend to take the position of willful blindness whilst the Israel provides not a small amount of Jordan's water. Um, we saw the, the, the claims even of, of, of Queen Rania, who was denying the, 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 the scope of the, the October 7 massacre, denying the fact that the women were systematically raped. And yet Israel continues providing uh, um, Jordan with, with even expanded amounts of water as opposed to to the peace, peace agreement and the, the volumes that, that, that were discussed there. Explain to me a little bit about Jordan. What, How is Jordan really playing that double game of, on the one hand, really beholden to Israel, but on the other hand, really under, doing its best to undermine Israel and support the Palestinians, even the terrorists, not even not even uh, uh, um, the moderates within the Palestinians, um, to, to destroy Israel, don't they understand that the destruction of Israel would would also mean the destruction of Jordan? Of course, of course. <laughs> they fully understand this. I mean, the Hashemites have always been a very skillful or devious. You go back to the World War I, which was the so-called Arab revolt against the Ottoman. They basically did, were very weak, you know, in Mecca, very small support. And still they managed to, to con the British Empire and to extract from them a far-reaching uh, concessions. Uh, they got two states, basically. I mean, they wanted the entire Middle East, but they have to contend themselves with two states, uh, Jordan, Iraq. For a certain time, they ruled what is today Saudi Arabia, but the Saudis uh, expelled them in uh, 1924. And then later, they had contacts with Israel, Abdallah, the grandfather, uh, of the present, uh, the great grandfather of the present king, and King Hussein had a very close relationship with Israel. As I said, they saved him in 1970. They, once they saved him in the 60s, even when an Egyptian airplane tried to shoot him down, and uh, he had very close relations with Israel. Still, in 67, when the moment came, he 
step the Israel in the back and uh, opened the war against the uh, specific Israelis, please not to do so. But afterwards, I think he basically washed his hands of uh, Judea and Samaria or the West Bank, as it came to be known since 1950. And uh, I think since then he has been more or less a, a true ally of Israel. You know, in, in the early, in 74, the Palestinians adopted the, the so-called phase strategy, which said that they would take any territory that Israel would, would surrender, establish a Palestinian entity there, and continue the fight until the liberation of the entire land of Palestine. And in fact, the Oslo Accords were the implementation of this strategy, as Arafat said openly, on the very day that it's under agreement with Rabin. But what people are unaware that one clause of the first strategy applies to Transjordan to Jordan as well. And it says that basically Jordan is part of uh, Palestine as well. So I'm sure this uh, point has not been lost on the Jordanians. But half of the population is Palestinian. And uh, have to, to walk a very tight rope. And I think their way of doing it is, is speaking harshly against Israel while publicly, uh, while privately telling Israel, ignore what we say in public because our approach is so and so. A bit like what I experienced in Harvard. I think this is the Jordanian approach, you know, doing uh, deals in private and in public pretending to be, you know, hard or even adversarial to, to Israel. To what extent do, do, do the populations in these countries understand that? I can understand that approach possibly as a polit at the political level and even really at the highest political level. But when you have the leaders of these countries so virulently attacking Israel, in Jordan, it doesn't go unseen. It, it, it creates that, that feeling of hatred amongst the Jordanians. It festers that that, that feeling of hate, the same possibly in, in, in Saudi Arabia and certainly in Egypt. Is there any way that we can find a, a mechanism to to really persuade these leaders that, that their open hostility to Israel isn't presenting and isn't providing any stronger uh, uh, ability for them to survive <laughs> long term and that really they're undermining their own causes? Yeah, I agree. I'm sure Israel, especially vis-a-vis -vis Jordan, I think, where we have a greater leverage, Israel should, you know, I'm sure we are doing it privately, but I think a public approach uh, might have helped in certain respect. I don't know about Mubarak. I mean, uh, Mubarak, from the start, as I said, he viewed the peace instrumentally and under his regime, basically, anti-Semitism. Egypt became the number one purveyor of anti-Semitism in the world. I mean, he really cultivated this culture, the regime. So, and uh, I'm not sure how much Israel tried to convince Mubarak not to, to go this way, but it's, it's not easy. I mean, there was a time that uh, the Saudis, uh, the Saudi king were much more anti-Semitic. I mean, the older king, of course, uh, Abdulaziz, Ibn Saud, and uh, Faisal, and others. I think the, the young generation, I mean, uh, Muhammad ben Salman, and uh, this generation are, are far less uh, anti-Semitic in this vein. And in fact, uh, I don't see that the Arab states have been, uh, even though it's a, uh, I don't follow it that closely on a daily basis, but it seems to me, my impression is that the Arab state's official line on the present conflict is far more uh, benign than uh, you could expect. I mean, of course, they say there will be a solution, there should be a ceasefire, even though privately I have no doubt that uh, tell Israelis don't even dream of a ceasefire. And there should be a Palestinian state, which of course they don't want uh, it to have. And uh, nobody really wants a Palestinian state. I mean, uh, not the Arabs. I'm not sure even the, the Palestinian leaders. I mean, Hamas definitely doesn't. Palestinian state is not the end goal of Hamas. Hamas, if, even if you look at the charter and the statements of his leaders, I mean, he's part of the Muslim Brotherhood and their objective is Islam throughout the world. So the destruction of Israel and the establishment of a Islamic entity 
as part to the wider expansion of Islam in the establishment of the world Ummah. So Hamas definitely doesn't want the Palestinian state as the end the result of its struggle. And the PLO, I mean, they have been so corrupt, they've really benefited they, from the misery of their people. They got billions and billions of dollars which were siphoned to their bank accounts all over the world. And they, you know, the Palestinians are always the victims. These are the latest draw to, to beat the Jews. And uh, if suddenly there is a state and they suddenly implemented the rights to Palestine, uh, free, free Palestine, then the world will lose interest. So the Arab state, the Palestinian leadership don't want it, apart from a small uh, group of uh, Israeli leftists and American administration and some European uh, governments, I don't think anyone really wants a Palestinian state. So that really brings us to one of our questions from, uh, um, from one of our, our, our audience. Um, thank you, Brian, for the question. Um, to what benefit can the American uh, administration push to promote the Palestinian state and change ending the conflict? Surely the, the American administration understands that no one really wants the Palestinian state. A Palestinian state would be a really a colossal failure, um, both uh, uh, um, internally, corruption, democracy. All they would be creating is really another uh, dictatorial totalitarian regime. Mm -hmm. And and so why do you think they keep on pushing that same uh, uh, um, really uh, non-starter as the only way um, that famous video of, of, of John Kerry um, the then Secretary of State in 2015 saying, well, there will no be there will be no peace in the Middle East without creating a Palestinian state. Um, and, and and obviously that not really being the reality. It just seems that the American administration is just is is unwilling to to divorce itself from from that that failed paradigm. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, there are two things. I mean, the, the main thing is, uh, is, of course, a naivete and ignorance. I mean, uh, they, are, they are not familiar with the Middle East. Uh, they don't know its uh, history, mentality, way of life. And they have a misconception that were instilled in them by, you know, so-called Arabists or other people who are supposedly uh, more familiar uh, with uh, this region and uh, are deployed in various administrations. And uh, now, Look, if you look again, if you go back to history, you see certain things. I mean, when uh, President Wilson in World War I supported the Balfour Declaration, later the Congress and uh, as well uh, endorsed it, the State Department and the Foreign Secretary at the time were very much against it. And uh, he said, uh, how could the Jews, you know, kill Jesus, uh, you know, have... Uh, something to do there, you know, be rewarded with a homeland and so on and so forth in 48, in 47, before the UN partition resolution, Secretary of State Marshall was against it. I mean, he even famously told Truman at certain point that if he recognized Israel, he won't, won't get his vote in the forthcoming election. So the State Department has been against a Jewish state already for 100 years in this respect. Nothing has changed. So originally, as I said, in World War I, it was pure anti-Semitism. But then I think it's a combination. Don't forget that uh, you have many Arab states, you have only one Jewish state, so you have a much greater influence of Arabists and ambassadors in the Arab world and diplomats in the Arab world. And the Arab world, the Muslim world, even more widely, are, are occupy a vast part of the globe. They had huge uh, natural resources, oil and other things, uh, waterways, the Suez Canal, uh, and therefore you have a combination of anti-Semitism, naivety, ignorance, and interest that combines them. At a certain point, you know, they came to, to, to believe that you, a Palestinian state uh, is the cornerstone on which a regional peace rests because they think that somehow the Arabs care about the Palestinians, but as I said, in my view, they don't. And therefore, if you resolve the, if you establish a state which helps 
almost inevitably uh, be a failed state, it won't solve anything. Uh, how does Blinken think that supposedly Israel agrees and tomorrow you have a Palestinian state? You think that Iran will stop uh, its uh, drive towards nuclear weapons? No, yeah. why should he? He doesn't do it because of Palestine. He does it because of their imperial ambitions and uh, so on and so forth. They have a certain ideology. We what you speak to about the notion that if you take today the notion that you put the Palestinian Authority in Gaza, you know, apart from the fact that it's not feasible practically because they won't be able to control the situation, but if you install them, them on basically on Israeli bayonets, they'll be immediately discredited by, by, by the Palestinians. If you defeat Hamas and then put the Palestinian Authority there, you think that the Palestinians in Gaza will accept it? They said, you are traitors. The Israelis brought you to dominate us. Just like some people said after the signing of the Oslo Accord, even a person like Edward Said, he called Arafat a traitor. He said, basically, you are doing Israel's bidding by signing the Oslo Accord. So even in this respect, I think it's counterproductive to talk about putting the Palestinian Authority in Gaza. Do you think that, uh, um, that uh, let's go along with that idea of Israel really agreeing to establish this Palestinian state, and let's put aside Iran for, 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 for a minute. Do you think that the, uh, the creation of a Palestinian state would suffice the PLO, would suffice Hamas, or... And would that be, the, the, as they say, the end of the conflict? That's what everyone's trying to look for, the end of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Would that uh, um, <laughs> creation of this failed, corrupt Palestinian state really bring that really panacea that they're looking for? No, I mean, that's complete nonsense. I mean, look, when, when the Oslo process began, I supported it, I must admit to my shame, because my analysis at the time was that the Arabs are increasingly acquiescing Israel's existence. And I saw, you know, a gradual process as a result of the Iran-Iraq war, the Lebanon war, and so on and so forth. And then came the Oslo and I said, oh, look, the Palestinians as well are acquiescing. What happened is that more and more Arab states and regimes accept Israel as a fact, but the Palestinians never did. In this respect, Benjamin Netanyahu was, you know, much more on spot than I was. I remember in London, a week before the agreement, uh, on the 6th or 7th of September, 93, uh, he was interviewed on British television and he spoke against uh, what's going to happen in the White House in a week. And he said that basically this is part of the first strategy and it's part of the Palestinian strategy to destroy Israel. And I thought, oh, aren't you exaggerating? No, he was right. And in this respect, the PLO has never changed this. Uh, at a certain point, I concluded, uh, I reached this conclusion, and I wrote, in fact, a book in two or three about it. The PLO, in this respect, is not different from Hamas. Neither of them accept Israel's existence. I mean, the, by the way, the, the PLO is not even much less religious than Hamas, because normally academics say the PLO is national, uh, uh, secular nationalism, Hamas is religious nationalism. But in fact, Arafat uh, was a graduate of the Muslim Brotherhood. Arafat grew up in Egypt, don't forget. Arafat was born and bred in Egypt. And he, he and many of his uh, co-founders of Fatah, who later joined the PLO, uh, were members of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. So, you know, I mean, the Palestinian state dominated by the PLO, let alone Hamas, will be will continue its drive for the destruction of Israel. Uh, one of the facts, for example, they say the, the right of the so-called right of return, what is the so-called right of return? Is the Arab catchphrase for the destruction of Israel via demographic submersion. They knew it already in 49, uh, you have statements by Arab leaders to this effect, Egyptians and others. So when they said we'll never give up the right of return, it means we'll never accept Israel's existence. Uh, we'll take the West Bank and then uh, we'll continue and talk about uh, the Israeli Arabs or the, the 48 Palestinians, as they call them, and so on and so forth. So no, I mean, of course, it's complete nonsense. 
a Palestinian state in the West Bank will never, a fully fledged, I mean, will never uh, bring peace. On the contrary, it will put Israel in mortal danger. Uh, just imagine what would have happened if uh, the same attack would have happened uh, you know, from the West Bank, they would have reached Tel Aviv in 20 minutes. Big yeah. deal, the, you know, on, on holiday or Saturday morning, uh, you drive at 6.30, you know, you're in 15 minutes in Tel Aviv from Kalkilia and Jenin, all these places, you go to the Galilee, Afula. So, I mean, it's a complete nonsense in this respect. And as I said, in any case, uh, sooner or later, Hamas will take over the Palestinian state. Effectively, by the way, the Palestinians have had their state since, uh, and this is what I argued in this article that you mentioned, in 202. I mean, Israel relinquished control of the Palestinians of the West Bank and Gaza. In Gaza, since 94, the PLO has do dominated them, not 205, 94. Israel had the, you know, kibbutzim in the south uh, of, the, of the strip, but it didn't dominate or didn't control or didn't rule the Palestinian population. In the West Bank or Judea and Samaria, Israel transfer control to the PA in January 96 and in Hebron, January 97. Since then, Israel hasn't controlled the Palestinians of the West Bank, 95% uh, of them. You have only about 100, 150,000 Palestinians in what is called Area C, which are basically quite empty spaces where Israel retains control, but there is no Palestinian population. So there has not been occupation. They've had their, if you want, independence since 96. And look what they did with it. They turned it into, yeah. an, into, a, into a vehicle to carry out m uh, um, hundreds and thousands of terrorist attacks and, to, uh, and, and, and really as the basis for both the ideological, educational and financial basis um, for uh, um, the October 7 massacre. Um, Dr. Kosh, unfortunately, as much as I would like to sit and, and, and stay with you for longer, uh, um, our time has run out. Um, one, uh, one quick uh, um, prediction of where we're going. Uh, I understand that making predictions are difficult, obviously, but where do you think we're going with Saudi Arabia? Will they uh, um, choose the path of rationality and normalization with Israel, or will they stick with that radical Iranian uh, uh, um, uh, uh, axis of evil? I think to use uh, the terminology of some Israelis, we have to help the Saudis save, them, save themselves from themselves. We have to defeat Hamas. Without defeating Hamas, the entire uh, structure will collapse. So I don't think uh, there is a point to get today to talk about uh, the so-called day after so long as the job is not done. If the job is not done, uh, Saudi Arabia will look for other options, as will some other Arab states. If we defeat Hamas, I think the Saudi-Israeli uh, alliance uh, will, uh, will go ahead. And of course, it depends on Hezbollah, if, if there is no war in the middle, which that Hezbollah really is, and how it evolves, yeah. That really is, I think, the critical analysis um, and takeaway that if Israel isn't capable of um, of, of defeating Hamas, um, really a rogue, small terrorist organization um, in, in, in terms of the Middle East, then we are likely to lose much bigger uh, uh, um, and much higher value allies in the area or potential allies in the area. And that has to be something which is taken into account when we're discussing everything um, regarding the war with Gaza. Um, Dr. Kash, thank you very much for joining us. Um, to our audience, thank you for joining us uh, again. We will be back with you again at four o'clock Israel time, which is uh, nine o'clock in the morning Eastern Standard Time and uh, uh, two o'clock in the afternoon in England, in London. So uh, um, we hope to see you again. In the meantime, Dr. Karsh, keep safe. And to our audience, keep safe.